Well, good evening again, everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday night as we assemble ourselves around these phones. Uh, for those of us that are having problems getting on the phone, uh, but thank God that we are on. Pray that it stay up. Uh, thank God for another Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, I just want to welcome you guys to Wednesday night dinner as we continue to study God's Word uh, together. Uh, I want to open up with a prayer tonight before we go into our study together. So if you would bow with me, pray with me, we're going to ask God's blessings upon our study tonight. Father, we just want to come right now thanking you. Thanking you for the time we have tonight just to study your word. Father, we thank you because you've been so good to us throughout this day, throughout this week. And Father, we ask you now to watch over us throughout the rest of this night. Bless our study on tonight. May the things we learn, the things we study tonight, will help us to be better in the future than we've been in the past. Again, we thank you for all of those that have joined the class on this evening. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everyone. Again, welcome to Wednesday night dinner for those that have just tuned in. I want to encourage you tonight to be turning your Bible to Galatians <coughs> chapter number two. <clears throat> Galatians chapter two. That's where we are going to be studying. We'll be doing an expository study uh, from the book of Galatians chapter two on tonight. Now remember we concluded chapter one on last week. Last week, you remember, we talked about how though Judaizer teachers had came to the churches of Galilee. They were undermining Paul, telling the churches there that they can't believe Paul. Uh, <coughs> Paul was not really giving them the truth. So Paul had to defend not only his apostleship, but he defends the gospel, the good news. So Paul had to go back and tell them. He gave his testimony. Uh, you guys remember how it used to be, but he had changed. He had went into Arabia uh, after he was converted on the Damascus <coughs> Road. But somehow another of those false teachers had convinced uh, the members of the church, the new church uh, in Galilee, uh, that Paul said, I, I, I marvel that you guys are so soon uh, removed uh, from uh, uh, the gospel, removed from that which I had taught you. <coughs> So when we get to the end of chapter 1, Paul had now went from Damascus to uh, Arabia, and he said he spent three, three years in the desert of uh, Arabia. During those three years, God was preparing uh, Saul, who would later become Paul. He was preparing him <coughs> to preach and teach the gospel. You remember Paul said that what he got, he did not get from man. Uh, the gospel did not come from Peter and James and John. The gospel he taught came directly from a revelation of Jesus Christ. So that was Paul's defense for the gospel. So now we're going to move into chapter 2. I pray you guys are there. Chapter 2. Let's begin with verse number 1. Galatians 2, 1 said, Then, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, you remember back in chapter 1, <coughs> Paul had went to Jerusalem, and he went there, and he went and stayed with Peter for about 15 days. Now, keep in mind, from Damascus' experience, his conversion, he had been gone up for three years. Now, Paul said, it had been 14 years since I've been to Jerusalem. Mm. Now, we don't know what happened with Paul during those 14 years. By fact, someone said they were lost years of Paul's life. But we do know where he was. 
Matter of fact, the Bible, you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that he was in Tarsus for about eight years. The latter part of chapter 1 in Galatians talks about him being in Syria and Cilicia. So we do have an idea of where Paul was, but what was he doing? Some said maybe he was establishing churches because what we will find out again from the book of Acts, that there were churches that had been established that Paul did not establish on his first missionary journey. So where did they come from? Evidently, maybe Paul had started churches in other areas during that 17 years. Because remember, three years plus 14 years was 17 years. Now, what he was doing, really we cannot say. Because really, we don't know what Paul was doing. But here's a hint. Maybe what God was doing with Paul in those 14 years was the same thing he was doing with Paul in those three years. What was he doing? In those three years when he left the Marcus and went to Arabia, God was preparing Paul for ministry. Maybe God preparing Paul for <coughs> ministry during those 14 years uh, as well. Now, as I begin to study this and look at this, you know, it's amazing. It's exciting to me to know that Paul was actually taught not only by Gamaliel that we read in the book of Acts, but by Gamaliel he was taught in the Jewish religion. He was taught the law, that of Moses. But when it came to grace and truth, he was taught by the best. He was taught by the one and only God himself. Now I was thinking, boy, wouldn't it be nice that instead of going to a preaching school or going to a Bible school or going to some university and spend eight years studying Bible and learning Bible from some professors, wouldn't it be nice that you could take 17 years of your life and just be taught by Jesus, mm. just be taught by God Amen. himself. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? Mm. Now we can understand when Paul goes back to Jerusalem, then we're going to find he's going to go to Antioch, and from there, this guy is going to preach and spread the gospel everywhere he go. I can understand now why Paul had such courage. I understand now why he didn't fear what people did to him, nor did he fear what people said about him. He didn't fear when people talked about the gospel because he had been taught by the Lord himself. So here's what Paul did. He said, well, after 14 years, I've been to Jerusalem once, met with Peter, stayed with him 15 days, and I saw James also, but none of the other ones I actually saw. Now, 14 years later, he returns to Jerusalem. Now, we're going to find out why he goes to Jerusalem later on, and we actually find it in the book of Acts. That's why I told you, in order to understand any of the epistles of Paul, I mean from Romans to 1st to 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, all of them, it behooves you to get a thorough knowledge of the book of Acts because it's going to help you to understand some of the things that happen in these epistles and why Paul said what he says. We, are re we really understand about what happened when he goes back to Jerusalem because we're going to find that out in the book of Acts. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But he says he went back to Jerusalem and he took Barnabas and he took Titus. Now that is very interesting because Barnabas, you remember, the son of consolation, 
was very encouraging to Paul. My fact, remember in Galatians 1, verses 18 and 19, when he said that after three years, I went up to Jerusalem with Peter, a boy within 15 days, and other the apostles say none but James, uh, the Lord brother. Now, this time, he's going to go back, but he's going to carry somebody with him. Well, who is he going to carry? He's going to carry Barnabas. Now, Barnabas was well respected among the leadership in Jerusalem, according to the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, and also Acts chapter 11 and verse number 22. Well, let's just see uh, what those passages say. Now, in Acts 4, <coughs> 36 and 37, the Bible says, and Joseph, who by the apostle were surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of <coughs> consolation. He was a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Having land, he sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here we learn a little something about Barnabas. Barnabas was an encourager, the son of consolation. He was a Levite. In other words, we already know Barnabas was a Jew. He was not a Gentile, but he was a Jew. Now notice Acts 11 and verse number 22. It said, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas that he should go as far <coughs> as Antioch. Now, when the church got together and wanted to send somebody to Antioch church there, they sent a very respectable man by the name of, of Barnabas. So we see then when Paul says, the next time I went to Jerusalem, I took Barnabas, a very respected guy among the Jews. But not only did he take Barnabas, he said, I also took Titus. Now, let's see if we can learn a little something about Titus. The first thing I want you to notice about Titus is that Titus is not a Jew. Titus is a Gentile convert. Titus was a remarkable man. He was associated <coughs> with Paul. Paul loved Titus. Matter of fact, he trusted Titus. Matter of fact, he makes mention of him in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 13. Paul referred to Titus as my brother and says how he had no peace when Titus was absent from him. Let's see what the Bible said. In 2 Corinthians 2, 13, the Bible said, I had no rest in my, in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of him, I went this to Macedonia. You hear what Paul said? Paul said, Titus meant so much <coughs> to me that I was just <clears throat> troubled. I was stirred. I found no rest. I was restless. Why, Paul? Because Titus wasn't there. I had no peace because I missed Titus. So we see just how much Paul loved this guy, Titus. My fact in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 6, he said, Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Paul said, guess what? God does the comforting. And God will comfort <coughs> all of us because he is the God of comfort. But Paul says, you don't know who really comforted me? Wasn't Peter? Wasn't so much Barnabas and James and John? But I was really comforted by Titus. It was something about this young 
Gentile convert that was so encouraging and blessed the very life and spirit of Paul Amen. to be comforted me. But then in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 6, notice what he says. It said, in so much that we desired Titus, that as he begun, so he would finish in you also the grace also. And he's <coughs> still talking about this collection that was taken up. Paul said, we just desired Titus. He, he, he just wanted Titus in his presence. Amen. Then you get to verse 16. I'm still in chapter 8 of verse of 2 Corinthians. He said, but thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. What did Paul say? Paul said, the same care that I had for you. Yes. God put that same care in the heart <coughs> of Titus. Amen. In other words, Titus cared just as much for you all as I did. Yes. That's how much Paul thought about and cared for Titus because they, they, they had a heart that intertwined one with another. Paul just loved this young guy. But then let's look at another verse. In verse number 23, still in chapter 8, 7 Corinthians, notice how he addresses him, uh, Paul. Said, well, any do acquire a Titus? He is my partner and, and fellow. my fellow helper. Paul said, if you really want to know something about, about Titus, I'm going to tell you two things about Titus. Number one, he's my partner. In other words, he's my right-hand man. But the second thing, he's my fellow helper. I, I just can't hardly go without this guy, Titus. I can't do without Titus because he's my partner and my fellow helper. But Paul also desired Titus. My thing, you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 18. I hope you're writing these down, even if you ain't got time to flip over and find them. But in 2 Corinthians 12, and verse 18, Paul said, I desire Titus, and with him I sent a brother. He said, did Titus make gain of you? Walk we not in the same spirit? Walk we not in the same steps? Paul said, when I thought about somebody to take the money that was taken up, he says, Hey, I, I thought about Titus. <coughs> I mean, I trust this guy. He's my right-hand man, and I just believe in him. He said, now, when I sent Titus to you, did, did he make gain of you? Did he rip you off? Now, you do remember, I did not take anything from you Corinthians. Now, let me ask, did Titus take anything? Did Titus rip you off? Did we not walk in the same spirit, he said, and walk not in the same steps? In other words, Paul says, Titus was my protege. He, he, he was just like me. I guess Paul kind of took this young guy under his wings, sort of like he did with Timothy. You know, he called him his son as well. So Paul says a lot about Titus. Matter of fact, let me give you one more. In Titus chapter 1 and verse number 4, when Paul is writing book, he said, To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Notice how Paul addresses Titus. He's my partner. He's my fellow helper. My friend, he's my son. Not biological son, but he was Paul's son in the gospel. So when we read verse number one, now I know it took us a long time to get through verse one, but when you read verse number one, when Paul says, after 14 years, I went back to Jerusalem and I took with me Barnabas and Titus 
also. Now I think we got a little better understanding of why God, why Paul took these two guys because they meant so much to him. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 2. All right? Paul said, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now Paul said, now when I went to Jerusalem, now you got to remember, this was a long time. Long time. People in Jerusalem still hadn't forgot what Paul had done when he left Jerusalem. Even the apostles was kind of leery of Paul. Paul said, and when I went, I went by revelation. In other words, God himself told Paul to go. God directed him to go back to Jerusalem. He did not go because James sent for him. He did not go because Peter called him and told him to come. No, he said, I went up by revelation. And when I went, I had a conversation with them about the gospel that I preached to the Gentiles. Now, why would Paul have to defend that to them? <coughs> he had to go to them. Now, he said he went to privately to them which were of reputation. Now, if you didn't already read second, the second chapter of Galatians, you know who Paul is referring to. You know who they were of reputation. He's going to tell you a little bit later on who he's talking about. But he said, when I went, I didn't go in front of the whole church. I didn't go in front of everybody. But I call these three guys to the side. And I met with them privately. Now, that was the reason why Paul did that. I think because Paul had been taught by Jesus, Paul also had learned a lot of humility about himself. Paul also had found out and learned that it's not all about him. It's all about God. So Paul said, when I went, I didn't publicly make known to these guys about the gospel that I preached unto the Gentile. No, I went to them privately and I taught them about what I had preached to the Gentiles. Now, why would he do that? I think Paul was meeting with these guys so that they would understand before anybody else. Because if he could not have gotten them on board, then he was going to have problems uh, with everybody else in Jerusalem. That's why he said that he went lest by any means uh, that I should run or had run uh, in uh, vain. Paul wanted to make sure that what he preached to the Gentiles before he even came back to Jerusalem, it was okay with them. Now, when you get to verse 3, it says, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, when he went back to these guys, you guess, now remember, he took Barnabas and he took Titus. Barnabas was a Jew. Titus was a Gentile. Now, you remember, they were still under the impression, especially some of these false teachers, that in order for a Gentile to become a Christian, they had to first become a Jew. They had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. But notice what Paul says here. He says, when I met with Peter, James, and John, those of reputation, he said they didn't even compel Titus to be circumcised. 
Well, it's not. No. Now, now, why is that? Now, you remember in Acts, I believe it's Acts chapter 16, uh, he did circumcise Tim Timothy. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a reason for that. That's right. Because Timothy, uh, mother and grandmother, was Jewish. Yes. And Paul knew that in order for Timothy to really be successful in preaching to the Jews, he had to be circumcised. He never would have been affected in the Jewish religion trying to preach Christ to the Jews if him being a Jew hadn't been circumcised. So Paul said he didn't have to. Yes. Okay. Keep in mind. Timothy didn't have to be circumcised That's to right. be saved. That's right. But Paul thought it best for him to do it. Yes. So that he could reach more Jews. That's right. But he didn't have to do that to Titus. Why? Because Titus wasn't a Jew. Was not. Titus was a Gentile. But when Paul got through explaining the gospel that he preached among the Gentiles, Peter, James, and John did not say a word about Titus being uh, circumcised. But notice verse number four. And that because of false brethren, unaware brought in, who came privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Jesus Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. Paul said, guess what? There were some false teachers, some false Judaizers, who everywhere I went, every church I established, especially among the Gentiles, they would come right behind me and tell the folk that, no, no, you, you know, if you're a Christian, you, you got to be circumcised. You got to keep the law of Moses. That's what he talked about in chapter number one. Paul said, not so. If anybody come with any other gospel, Beside that which I have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Even if an angel from heaven, let him be a curse. Paul said, but guess what had happened? There were some of these false brethren. Now, notice how Paul addresses them. He addresses them as brethren. They was probably uh, had accepted Christ, but they were still trying to hold on to the law of Moses. Maybe they had become Christian, but they were still telling the folk, you, you got to add something to your Christianity. And what is it you got to add? You got to add circumcision, keeping a certain diet, keeping the law of Moses, keeping the Sabbath. So they was adding all of this stuff to it. So Paul said, they brethren, but they false. False brethren. What made them false? What made them false was that they were telling the Gentile Christian, you got to add something to faith in Christ. Paul said, no, it's all about faith. It's all about faith in Jesus. In other words, Jesus has done all the work. No work is left for you to do. Jesus has done all the work about salvation. Okay? Now, that don't mean you don't have to work. You just don't have to work for your salvation. When Jesus hung on the cross, you remember, Jesus says, it is finished. Now, what was finished? He wasn't finished because, see, he still had a lot more work to do. What was finished when Jesus said, it is finished? The work for salvation for mankind yes. was finished. Yes. When Jesus died, it's, it's, it's finished. Yes. So here's what Paul is saying, that it is done. It's a done deal. It's not about what you must do, but it's about what he has done. But the false teachers who came in, I like this word, other words. In other words, they kind of slipped under the radar, thinking Paul didn't see them, Paul didn't hear them. They just came in unaware, subtly. They just 
came in to the church and was speaking these things. So you got to be careful about some folk that kind of come in unaware. Folk come in under the radar and spread heresy and say things that's not true. Paul said they came in, and not only did they come in and teach false doctrine, but, but they came in to spy out our liberty. What was the liberty? The freedom we have in Christ. We have freedom in Christ. It's not about what you must do. You are free in Christ. And Paul said, these guys that came in privately to kind of spy out our freedom uh, that we have in Christ. And guess what they were trying to do? They were trying to bring us back into bondage. Whenever you go back under the law and try to keep the law thinking that's what's going to save you, you are actually going back into bondage. I like another version that actually said they carried them back into slavery. Back into slavery. Because that's all you was under the law. Now, Paul says, what they were trying to do is just kind of find out and, 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 and harm the liberty that we have. But then in verse number five, he said, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for one hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul said, guess what, Galatians? He said, when they came in and they were trying to spy out our liberty and they were trying to bring us back into bondage and telling us you got to be circumcised and you got to do that, Paul said, we did not listen for one minute. I think the Bible said an hour to these guys. We didn't give ear to what they were saying. In other words, Paul said, we did not pay these guys any attention. Why? Because we wanted the truth of the gospel to continue with you. And you know what I've learned from that? There's some people you just don't even need to entertain. There are some things people say you ought not even waste an hour, waste a minute on what they have to say. When you know what they are up to, when you know they are up to no good, and they are spreading and teaching false doctrine, Paul said, we did not even give them the time of day. We didn't listen to the, them at all, not even for an hour. Why? Because we wanted the truth of the gospel to continue with you. But then you get to verse number six. He said, but of these who seem to be somewhat, whatever they were, it didn't make it no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. For who, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Now, now, who is he talking about? Paul said, you know, when I went back to the conference, and we're going to look at that. I don't know if we get a chance to look at it tonight. But you remember the conference in Acts chapter 15? Paul had to go up before, you know, the Jerusalem council. Paul says, but these who seem to be somewhat. Now, I don't know the original language of that. I don't know if we can interpret that as the English says or whether or not that's the way Paul said it in the original language. Because if you know it, Paul said, but these guys who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it make it no matter to me. You know, if they were the pillars of the church, they, I don't care. I don't care if Peter, James, and John was the pillar of the church, if they was, quote, head of the church, a bishop of the church. Peter said, I don't care who they were. Now, you want to know why Paul could say that? If that's what he meant, because Paul had been taught by who? By God himself. So he said, these guys who considered to be pillars of the church, it, it don't matter to me who they are 
Because why? Because God accepts no person. God, God is no respecter of person. God don't expect except them more powerful or more mighty or more higher than me just because they are, quote, pillars of the church in Jerusalem and they are head of the council in Jerusalem. God ain't no respecter of person. It really doesn't mean anything to me. He said, for they who seem to be somewhat and come, they didn't add anything to me. I mean, I didn't get anything from them. What I teach and what I taught the Gentile, he said, what I taught you guys, I did not get it from them. They, they didn't add anything to my God. Why? Because, see, I got it straight from God. But then in verse number seven, he said, but, and I like this, but, contrary wise when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision hmm. was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter for he that brought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the, the Gentiles. What is Paul saying here? Go back to verse 7. He says, when they saw that the gospel that I preached to the uncircumcision, now who was that uncircumcision? It was the Gentiles. When they saw Peter, James, John, Phyllis, when they saw that the gospel that I preach to the Gentiles that was committed to me as same as the gospel that Peter preached to the Jews, those of circumcision, he said that for he that brought effects in Peter to the apostle to the circumcision, the same was mighty toward me to the Gentiles, the same. Yeah. Who God, God no respect the person. The same thing that God allowed Peter to do in preaching the gospel, the good news of grace and faith to the Jews, God allowed me to do that to the Gentile. Same thing is what Paul is saying. Amen. Now, verse number nine is going to get back to those of reputation. And we'll end up. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, as a matter of fact, it, that, that's who they were. I don't know if they were just ascribed this position, or they were really the pillars of the church. When they seemed to be pillars, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathens as they were unto the circumcision. When Peter, Cephas, or James, and Peter, and John, when they heard what Paul had said, had they had taken in what Paul had said about the grace that had been given to him. They gave him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. In other words, what is they saying? What is Paul saying? Paul says, you guys are okay. You guys are okay. Now, I want you to remember that. Because later on in this chapter, we're going to see something that's going to take you right back to verse 9. Now, let, let me say it. Let me show it to you again. I'm going to read verse 9, and I want you to get verse 9 in you because a little later on in this chapter, not going to get to it tonight, but a little later on in this chapter, we're going to refer back to verse 9. When James, Cephas, and John 
who seemed to be pillar received the grace that was given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the heathens or go to the Gentiles. And they was going to go to the Jews. But he said, but only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which we were going to do anyway. Now, where are we going to get this from? We're going to get this from Acts 15. Now, here's your assignment for next week. Because my time is about up. I, I can't cover Acts 15. But I want you to go back between now and next Wednesday night, Lord's willing. Read Acts 15. Because when you read Acts 15, it's going to help you to understand a lot of what we're going to continue to see in Galatians chapter 2. But not only what we're going to continue to see, but what we have previously seen, okay? Because in Acts 15, we're going to read about the first uh, Jerusalem council and why Paul was even there, okay? Why was he in bond was even there? But Acts 15 is going to tell us. Okay, let, let's stop right there. And we'll pick up Lois Will with Acts 15 Good teacher. Uh, on next week. Okay? Good teacher. Now, go ahead and read the rest of that um, Galatians 2. <coughs> Hope you already read it. <coughs> go ahead and read the rest of Galatians 2. But read Acts chapter 15 before next Wednesday night. Let's pray. Father, we come right now thanking you for our study time together. Father, we thank you for what Paul has said. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for Paul willing to stand on the truth. No matter uh, who believes it, accepts it, Father, we, he, he, he was one of those that was bold and had courage to just stand on the truth, on the gospel, the good news. Father, we thank you for what we learned from Paul, how we should stand uh, as well. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that Jesus died. We thank you for the good news of salvation that he provided for all of us. Father, we ask you right now to be with those that are sick, uh, those that are in bereavement. Father, we ask you to comfort their hearts. Give your prayer praise, Father, for and bringing Antonio through surgery and bringing him back home. Father, we thank you, Father, for all of those who have may, may have had surgery or they may have lost loved ones. We just want to pray. Thank you for everyone on the call, everyone that attended class tonight. Father, I just want to say thank you. But now watch over all of us as we lie down tonight. Pray that we see another beautiful day on tomorrow. And we will use that day for your glory. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Good night, everyone.